Well, this morning we were in Revelation 21. Our opening text tonight is going to be from Isaiah 65. We're looking at the creation of the new heaven and the earth, the new earth, and there will be some redundancy tonight, otherwise some repetition of what we talked about this morning because we are explaining this a little further. One of the things that uh, many people in the world do not understand is that the first creation, God cursed it. And in that curse, it is cursed to a destiny of destruction. So the end of the world is literally, it's a dissolution. It's going to be dissolved with fervent heat. The whole first creation. Uh, it will not exist anymore as it does today. And God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Wherein he will dwell with his redeemed. That's the same. So only those born again into that new Genesis uh, will be there at that time. The rest, of course, will be condemned to the second death and the eternal lake of fire, which will be created from the, what I believe, the leftovers, <laughs> the melted aspect of the first creation. And uh, so we have some specificity here tonight, and I think, the reason why in Revelation chapter 21, God gives us these dimensions and details and specifics is because he wants to know, us to know that this new creation has size, therefore space. It exists uh, for us. There'll be a place for us. So although there won't be any time there, there will be matter because we'll have a new body, a glorified spiritual body. And uh, there will be a place for us to dwell. But that place is going to be come together in perfect union with God. Otherwise, we will dwell with God uh, during the rest of eternity. The God life will, you know, there's some wonderful things here for us to see. And faith is the only, only way you can see them is by faith. That's how God intends us to see them. So that our vision is opened up to these things. We see them by faith and we can own them by faith. Otherwise, they become real to us. If we really believe in the God of the Bible, that he's inspired the words of the Bible and has communicated us to us for the purposes of revealing for, to us what he is going to do and what he is doing, uh, he then by faith we can know these things with assurity. And so it is true. So again, the only way we can know uh, for sure is by the word of God. People say, well, why do you spend so much time teaching the Bible? <laughs> that kind of answers itself after a while, doesn't it? Uh, the one reason I'd be more prevalent to ask people, why don't you spend more time uh, preaching and teaching the Bible? Well, the reason why is because most of those pastors don't even believe the Bible. They don't believe the Bible is the word of God. They say they do. They have variations of levels of belief in it. But liberalism, liberals don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I always get a, it's always a kind of a chuckle. And then an anger rises up in the eye of my back of my neck. I get the flush on the forehead and then my hair stands up. Every time I hear a liberal quote the Bible. Because <laughs> I know they don't believe it. And then secondly, they're only quoting it uh, for their own purposes and almost always misquoting it or using it in the wrong way. So although further explanation of what the new Jerusalem will be, that's going to descend out of heaven now. That's where God dwells now. And that's going to descend out of heaven. That new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, as we see in this text in Revelation 21. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of conjecture we can make, uh, some probabilities to that conjecture. And John saw, literally watched, the new heaven and the new earth created. I pause for that for just a moment for you to think about that. Because guess what? 
so will you and I stand and watch it being created. We'll watch Jerusalem descend down into this new earth. We'll watch it, right? we got to be someplace, and we're not going to be in the lake of fire, right? So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be watching the creation of this new heaven and this new earth. We'll be right there, just as John was seeing it, we'll see it. So exactly what this entails, we're not sure, but we can be sure that the old is no more. It's gone. Now the Greek word uh, kahinos here is used instead of the Greek word nia. New heaven. It's kahinos, not nia. We say, what, does, what difference does that make? It makes a lot of difference. Because kahinos means new in kind or new uh, in a different kind. Well, Nia simply means new in time. So Nia would mean new of the same kind, but new in time. It's going to be just like the old one, but new in, new in, in, new in, in the same kind. But Kahinas is new of a different kind. And of course, we see why it's different there in some of those texts. Well, well no more curse, right? That's one of the things that's there. So Isaiah 65, verse 17. I don't know how much, how far we'll get tonight because we have the Lord's Supper later on. But open up your Bible there to verse 17 and 18. And we'll look at this. And then in Isaiah 66, we'll look at another portion. I invite you to stand if you're able, and then we'll have a word of prayer. You're welcome to stay seated if you'd like. Verse 17. For behold, God says, I create new heavens and a newer. And the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Now, I don't know what that all means, but my understanding of that is God is going to take away, in some degree, the memory of all of that. It's going to not just pass out of our mind, but eventually won't, we won't even think about it anymore. But verse 18, but be ye glad. Why? Because the old is gone. The curse is no more. And rejoice, what? Forever in that which I create. That's the new heaven and the new earth. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Now that's a, a great verse of scripture for us. Lord, tonight we do already rejoice. For Lord, we see as John sees in his description the future that is ours. We know with surety, Father, of what you are going to do because you've told us what you're going to do and you never have ever broken your promise. And so, Father, we praise you and rejoice tonight in the faith that you can give us in the knowledge of the future. And, Lord, for all the wondrous promises that heaven is not just a long, 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 long time like we are now, but a completely new creation. And we rejoice in that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We'll come back in that same context. We come into Isaiah chapter 66 and look at verse 22. Now, I encourage you to read both of those chapters, the whole chapters. There's a lot there. But verse 22 starts out like this. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I, what? Will make... They haven't been made yet. I will make. Shall remain before me, saith the Lord. Otherwise, they're never going to be dissolved. The very fact that God cursed the first creation destined them to dissolution. But this is always going to be before him, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your name remain. This is a promise to the children of Israel. So those who say God's cast away his people and they're going to be completely obliterated from the world and they have become partners with the world in obliterating the, the Jews, they are antichrist. That very nature is antichrist. God doesn't want that. And we looked at last week that God cast away the priesthood of Israel, but not the nation of Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Again, God cast away his people? God forbid. So... And so shall your seed and your name remain, Israel. And it shall come to pass. Now when you say, when you see those words, it shall come to pass, right in the margin of your Bible, this 
is a sure thing. This is a sure thing. God says it was going to happen. What can you be what you can you count on? It's going to happen. That's what God says. It shall come to pass. Why? Because it's based upon the immutable promise of God. God can't break his promise. Okay, what is it? That from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me. Now that's a change. Right? What, what was, what's he talking about? In the Old Testament, the Mosaic Covenant, uh, the cycle of religious days went by the lunar calendar. But that lunar calendar is not going to be anymore because, frankly, I believe the moon's not going to even be there anymore. <laughs> and second, uh, the, from one Sabbath to another, there, there aren't going to be any Sabbaths anymore. But uh, uh, there's still, there won't even be any time there. But the great statement here, shall all flesh come to worship before me. What's he saying? Constant and continual worship of God. Now we worship God today, but we worship uh, only partially because we don't know God the way we, we should, right? We look through glasses darkly, Paul says. We are we have a we, we have a blinding and obfuscation of the spiritual in our eyes. We're blinded there uh, from the Greek. It actually means obfuscated. It's not we're not completely blind like it's complete darkness. We have an understanding of it. But it's like looking through, uh, you know, windows that are like our windows over here. They let the light through, but you can't see out of them. Uh, but that's the way it's going to be. So there's some light that comes through. But not then that won't be. There will be a constant and continual, no special day or days any longer. Um, that, of course, Hosea 2.11, those special days passed away. Today we worship the Lord seven days a week in the 24 hours a day. But here, there's not going to be any 24 hours. It's going to, going to be continuing. I'll get this. It won't be mundane. It's going to be so wonderful. And God's glory and God's wonder is going to be so amazing. You'll get, you'll get every single second of the day, you'll just stand in amazing, uh, amazing grace of God. And I would imagine in heaven, there will be moments we just burst out and sing, Amazing Grace. Just burst out singing it, because we'll understand. Oh, we understand partly now, but then we'll understand. We'll know him as he knows us. Verse 24, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of men that have transgressed against me. Now, what's he saying? Hell? Is going to be visible apparently. We're going to be conscious of those in hell. He says, For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Otherwise, we're going to understand that they got exactly what they deserved. Now, we deserved it too. Right? Don't you deserve hell? You deserve hell too, but we didn't. We don't get what we deserve because the grace of God. We accepted the grace of God in the gift of salvation. So we we got a gift. We didn't get what we deserve, but we'll understand then, and all eternity will be reminded of what people deserve when they refuse to believe, to repent, believe, confess, call, and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Now John probably saw a new planet. He called Earth. Now, the word earth is ghi here. It's soil, actually, being created. Otherwise, there was some substance to it. Not going to be substance like we have today. Obviously, the streets are gold, but to be able to see through them, they'll be like glass. And the uh, foundation stones are going to be precious stones where the light goes through, and uh, they'll, they'll be different. So it's going to be different. Not going to be like this creation. But John stood right there and watched it be created again. So will we. We'll be right there after the kingdom age and we'll watch our new home being being created for us. He then saw something else that, was in, that he was informed was the new Jerusalem. We read about that in Revelation 21, 9 through 10 this morning. And as I speculated this morning, perhaps the new Jerusalem is inside 
this sphere of a new earth, and then there's layers that come out for men to live, men and women to redeem, to live inside this new earth rather than upon its surface. Now, that's conjecture. Uh, you can take it or leave it. Won't bother me one way whether you accept that or don't accept it. It's just conjecture. And when you finally get to heaven, you can say, well, catch me was crazy. That's not the way it was at all. And I'll, I'll probably be right there. Well, I was stupid. But uh, nonetheless, we're taking a shot at it. Uh, so new earth is probably spherical as well, but its dimensions were beyond John's ability to estimate or comprehend. If you've got this uh, sphere of this new Jerusalem, that's almost two-thirds the size of planet earth, uh, how can you imagine an earth uh, that it's just a, a core, it's an earth's core, of the, it's a, the new Jerusalem is a core of this new earth. I mean, it's got to be an immense planet. So again, the dimensions given are just a new Jerusalem that descends inside the new earth. The gates John saw in the walls were probably giant circular arm open, openings that appeared like giant pearls to him, although the scripture does not say like pearls. Right? That says they're pearls. Again, we have so much spiritualizing of this text. I try to be literal. Uh, maybe it's not literal. Maybe this is a, a spiritualizing, but it does not say like pearls. It was only the word he had. To, it was was the only word he had to describe them. And each of these gates bore a name of one of the twelve tribes of Israel. This is the gates. There, remember, we have eight and a half mile long walls all the way around the New Jerusalem. And on each side, there's three gates uh, through which everyone could enter. And so the 12 foundations of the walls, again, are probably 12 layers in thickness. And each layer bears the names of one of the 12 apostles laying up on top of one another. Within each layer, there are various colors emanating that John uh, describes as precious stones. In other words, what appears to him as a result of what these precious stones would produce if light from the inside shined through the transparency of this wall of 12 layers. And there's probably something between these layers that make the layers apparent and creates this optical effect, a change in the optical effect of the layers with what, how you would designate between them. And the overall appearance of the wall, it says it's like jasper. And again, the light emanates from within this sphere, shines through the wall. And the light shining through jasper produces a green-white effect. This is probably the same effect John saw in Revelation 4, in verses 2 and 3. And how does he describe it there? He says, And I immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, a throne was set in heaven. This is the throne of God. Both the Father and the Son occupy this throne. But here it says, and, and, sat up, and sat on the throne, literally one, it says in the italicized. But we know both the Father and the Son occupy this throne. Jesus occupies the right hand of the Father. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Look at this. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So there's this green hue that comes out. Uh, like a rainbow, different shades of, of, of a rainbow that comes out around this throne, and it is the glory of God. Well, now, that extends in the New Jerusalem and goes through these walls, these foundation stones made of precious stones. And as this glory of God shines through these stones, they give off a different uh, shade, otherwise it's, there's a, a different color comes through the stones. So this new Jerusalem is the new heaven where God will dwell and where his throne will be. It will be suspended in space within the new earth with entrances in its walls. It will be lighted by the glory of God from within, which will go through the walls and shine out into the new earth. Otherwise, the glory that now fills the earth and fills the heavens where God's om omnipresence would be seen if we were not blinded to spiritual we would see that the space is not dark. It's filled with the glory of God. But since we're blinded to the spirit, so we can't see it. But here now we'll see it. And we'll see it and we'll see God in all of his glory. 
And that light will fill, literally fill the universe, the new universe, which will be created. So the redeemed will live on the inside in the presence of their heavenly Father and in His Son. He is the place Christ went to prepare for us in John 14, 2. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Uh, where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So that promise is there. So it is the place Christ went to prepare for us. So the size of the new Jerusalem by itself, this city, is immense. Would you agree? It's immense. Making it relevant to our comprehension even is difficult. Depending on the length uh, we use for a furlong, uh, it's a Greek word stadion, uh, 582 feet or 600 feet, one-eighth of a Roman mile. I used to run the mile in, the, in high school. And in those days, we ran the mile in feet, not uh, in or in yards, whichever one it was. It was 220 yards, 440, 880 was a half mile, and uh, a, a full mile was eight laps around uh, the, uh, the, the track. And that is essentially based upon this. That's exactly the same as what it was now. Now they have uh, they change it to meters, but in the at least in the Olympics. But here we still use this is using uh, the same kind of measurements. So uh, this, if this is spherical, this may be the radius of the sphere, thirteen hundred sixty-five miles across in four directions, and. Uh, uh, would make this a globe with a diameter of approximately 2,730 miles. The present Earth is at a diameter of 3,960, so about two-thirds of the present Earth. Is, uh, but not again, we're not living on this surface, we're living within it. This is a new uh, temple of Jerusalem, is uh, the Jerusalem, the new city is the new temple, uh, is the new living temple. But there is no, there is no neos here, we'll see that a little later. No physical temple. So the Greek word uh, uh, tet, uh, tetragonos here, translated four square, square, tetra, four, simply means four cornered. And the earth is round, but it is also referred to as having four corners. That's why for years theologians thought the earth was flat. And they argued, even though God speaks often, that it is a ball in the sky, you know, in the word of God. But uh, the earth is round, but it's also referred to having four corners. Uh, if you take a sphere and you put it within it, uh, you can put a square right inside of a sphere. Every perfect square goes inside of a sphere. So this probably refers to the four directions, north, east, south, and west. Uh, Isaiah 11, verse 12. By the way, there are still... Some people, there, there's a whole society called the Flat Earth Society in the world today. And uh, <laughs> these are some of the same scientists who are purporting the uh, new global warming issue. So uh, maybe it tells you a little bit of where the problem might be. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking about that. Isaiah eleven twelve, And he shall set up an ensign for the nation. And shall assemble the outcast of Israel, gather together for the dispersed of Judah, from where? From the four corners of the earth. This is the gathering together of the nation of Israel uh, during the kingdom age. Revelation 7, 1. And after these things I saw four angels. Where were they standing? On the four corners of the earth. Are they protecting people so they don't fall off the edge? You know, that's what the, the flat earth people would say. They're protecting uh, so people don't fall off the edge. Uh, so holding the four winds of the earth. Why, why four winds? Well, they blow in four different directions. That the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. That's in Revelation, uh, the judgments. Now another possibility is that this is a six-sided cube. So we'll give that conjecture as well with 12 levels of, uh, of a thousand furlongs each. So you have 12 levels of the New Jerusalem. With transparent walls, the glory of God would shine through in all directions, creating a global effect. 
Otherwise, as it shines through the walls, the, the light goes out, creates a global effect. But uh, I don't believe that, you know, as light goes out, natural light goes out from its source, it uh, ceases at a point where it, be, it spreads out to such a depth where it's no longer visible. It's overcome by the darkness uh, to that degree, but it's always visible. But that's not true of God's glory. God's glory wouldn't do that. So each level would have about, these levels, if there are 12 levels in this giant city, would have about 2 million square miles of living space, or about half of the area covered by the United States, which is 3,621,707 square miles. That's a global, that is a land area of the United States. If that were the case, the total living space would be equal to over six times that of the United States with over one mile between levels. And whatever these dimensions may describe, its size is enormous. And let me just say, there's plenty of room for all of God's redeemed. Plenty of room. Now, there is significance to the 12 foundation stones of the city also. This is significant in that the walls are a memorial to the righteous works of believers and the works of the Holy Spirit in them and through them. And God constantly creating memorials. The Lord's Supper, as we'll celebrate tonight, is what? It's a memorial. When God brought the children of Israel uh, through the Jordan River, what are they supposed to do? Every one of the heads of the tribe were to take a stone and pile it in the center of the Jordan River that now is dry land and make a, a mountain of stones there for what? A memorial. God is constantly giving us memorials for us to remember what he did. The Passover was a memorial. So people would remember that what God did. So God is constantly creating memorials. Here in the new creation is a memorial as well. So the significance that the walls are mentioned are the memorial to the righteous works of believers. But this memorial is not that these are the works of the believers that they did, but the memorials of what the Spirit of God did through their lives. So even as they were not yet in the new creation, everything that has been accomplished for Christ in this world has been accomplished by His Spirit through born-again believers who have let the Spirit of God go work through them. Uh, the local church of the church age is an embryonic form of the new, cre new creation in the new Jerusalem. Go with me to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll probably have to quit with these two texts tonight. We're going to look at this text and then in Ephesians chapter 2. We're saying that the, the church right now is intended to be an embryo or an embryonic representation of the New Jerusalem, which is a spiritual entity. Yes, there are physical characteristics to it, but it is primarily a spiritual thing. Just as the church is intended to be a spiritual. This a building. People say, well, where are you going? I'm going to the church. And they say, well, that's the building. People think that's a building. No, the church is the people. And the, the people are a spiritual entity forming a living temple of living stones. And that's, that's the church. They assemble, those living stones come and assemble. They form the church when they assemble. They are the church assembled. When the believers assemble, that becomes the church. When they are dispersed, they become an evangelistic missionary endeavor. Look at verse uh, 12 of chapter 3, 1 Corinthians. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, uh, that's the foundation of the apostle, the foundation which is Jesus Christ. Paul says, I have laid the foundation which is Jesus Christ. That's, that's your salvation. Now, your responsibility is to build upon that foundation. That's what your works are. You are Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 4, by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his, what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Well, here's what those good works are. Those good works that have come through that are gold, silver, 
and precious stones. But there are other things. That's the works of the flesh. That's wood, hay, and stubble. Now what happens when you put gold, silver, and precious stones to the fire? They're purified. What happens when you put wood, hay, and stubble to the fire? They're consumed. And so that's what verse 13 says. Every man's work shall be made manifest. How? They're going to be, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. So there are going to be a lot of Christians in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ standing in a pile of ashes, which is all their work done in the flesh. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is, whether it's in the flesh or whether it's spiritual, done by in partnership with the Spirit of God. If any man's work abide, otherwise it's not burned up, which he has built thereon, thereupon, upon the foundation of Jesus Christ, his salvation, he shall receive a reward. And the word is not salvation, it's a position to rule. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Otherwise, it doesn't affect his salvation, but he's going to be saved just as so by fire. Why? Because all his corrupted works will be consumed. He's going to enter into heaven uh, without any trust in those works either. Now, there's a lot of things we could look at that, but he says, verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? You're a spiritual entity, the local church. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And remember, he's already started this chart, this, this chapter off with, he says, I'd like to write unto you as a spiritual, but I can't, because you're carnal. So he concludes this chapter by warning them that they're going to have to stand before the judgment seat, and their works are going to be judged by God. And if they're wood, hay, and stubble done in the flesh, carnality, they're going to be consumed, and they're going to lose rewards. They're not going to have rewards. If they're done in the power of the Spirit, otherwise through sanctification and yielding to the Spirit of God, they're going to be purified, and uh, they're going to be blessed with rewards for that. Then come to Ephesians 2. We want to see that this New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ and is a spiritual entity. Even though it has physical dimensions, it's still the bride of Christ. Ephesians 2.18 for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Through Jesus Christ, we have access to the Father by one spirit. That is the spirit. How, how is that? That's being born again. The only way you have access to the Father through prayer, petitions, or fellowship is through the work of the Spirit of God. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints in the household of God. Now what is that? That's heaven. That's a new Genesis. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What is the foundation of the new Jerusalem? The 12 tribes of Israel are the gate, or the gates into the city, but the foundations are the apostles. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto what? A holy temple into the Lord. That's just New Jerusalem. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So the church and born again Israel are going to hold an eternal place of, of special blessing before God. Now all the redeemed will be there in the new heaven and the new earth. But the church, the bride of Christ, will always have a special place. And the nation of Israel, and now the espoused bride of God, uh, will hold a special place there too as they are wedded. Now, we're going to have to stop there tonight because our time is, I'd like to say, let's have some questions and conversation, but we wouldn't get out of here until midnight, right? So we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll have the Lord's Supper together. Our Father God, as we thank you for the vision of, of our future, uh, we believe in it with our whole heart. Knowing, Lord, that our destiny is already there, and we, as far as you're concerned, it's already happened, it just, it's, it's that sure. And we pray tonight for the lost in this world who just don't have a clue about any of this. Their pastors don't teach them because they don't know about it, or they, if they don't about it, they don't believe it. And we pray for others here tonight who uh, may need to be saved and born again. 
We ask, Lord, that you'd work in each heart and life as only you can. And help us, Lord, to partner with you as we become workers together with you in, in the work of the ministry. Thank you for the privilege, Lord, of being able to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll prepare for the Lord's table here.